planning on storing. Let's say, for example, I am going to use, I'm going to create a, a, a website like IMDB, the, the Internet Movie Database, where you can look up movies and do all kinds of stuff like that. All right. So what, what columns might we want to store about a movie? We might want to store the title of the movie. We might want to store the year that it was made. We might want to store um, how long it is. We might want to store the rating. You know, is it G, P, G, and so on. Let's say for the sake of argument those are the four things that we want to store. All right? Do any of those fields pop out to be the primary key? Not really. Pardon me, title? How many versions of King Kong are there? All right. Title and year. At least three. Title and year, maybe, but <laughs> remember our database, the foundation, solid we want this to be. I started to sound like Yoda there for a second. All right. We want the database to be solid. So, in other words, can you guarantee worldwide that in 2011 or 2012 or any year that there were no two movies that came out with the exact same title? Can you guarantee that? Yeah, I, I, I sure don't want to bet anything of substance on that. Because I'm guessing the world's a big place, right? And there may be a independent short feature film made in, uh, you know, made in Australia that has the same name as another short independent film made in Canada or something like that. All right, so I'm not going to bet that there's two movies with the same, that there's not two movies with the same title. Yes? I'm not sure, but UPC, because I'm not sure if they're different between stores or whatnot, but... Well, UPC, um, UPC relates to a product, right? So in other words, if I bought a regular DV versus DVD versus a Blu-ray, there'd be two different UPCs. So UPC doesn't do it, right? Because UPC isn't associated with a movie. UPC is associated with a particular packaging of a movie. So, that one go. So, we don't have a primary key. So what do we do? Do we th throw up our arms and say, oh, sorry, I guess we can't do this. No. All right. This is where you have what is called a surrogate key. All right. A surrogate key is where you essentially just make up an ID number, and every movie's going to get an ID number. All right? Student number is an example of a surrogate key. When you were born, did you get your student number assigned at that point? Did your parents say, oh, look at our beautiful baby. Well, we're going to name her Eleanor, and oh, yes, her student ID is going to be, you know. No, of course not. All right? So that's not something that's really true about you. And if you go to another school, you have a different student ID. All right? So you're not born with that. That's not really an attribute of you. That's something that someone made up. You enrolled. Okay. The last student that enrolled was this student number. So guess what? You get this student number. Right? That's how you determine, you know, your student number. It's just made up. It's just assigned sequentially. All right. Um, one thing I like to do for my amusement is actually my employee number is the same as my student number. You know, once you're in the system, it doesn't matter if you're a student or faculty or whatever. You have the same ID number, which actually is kind of good. All right. There's, there's good reasons for that. I like to look at, because uh, I, I did attend here for a year. I like to look to see if there's any students in my class that have a lower student number than me. And so far, I've only ran into like two or three students that have had a lower student number than me. Um, anymore, students don't even have the same number of digits as me. 
I have a five-digit student number, and, and uh, students like now is in the 300 or 400 thousands, I think. So at any rate, student number is just a sequential number that gets assigned. First person gets this, second person got that, and so on down the line. Well, in the case of movies, we could do the same thing with movies. We could make a movie ID. And the first movie that we entered would be movie one. Does it matter what that movie is? No. There's nothing that, nothing about that movie that makes it special to be movie one. It's just the first one we happen to enter. All right? But it's important that it has a primary key. Why? Because if we wanted to point something to that movie and say, this actor was in this movie, we need a primary key to establish that relationship. So we have to have a primary key. That primary key doesn't really need to make sense outside the database, though. So what makes this a surrogate key, all right, is the fact that outside the database, it doesn't really mean anything, all right? That's different than what are called natural keys. A natural key is where outside the database it's still meaningful. In other words, outside of the database, people really in the real world know this room as BU-205. Those numbers mean something. BU means it's in the BU building, 205 means it's somewhere on the second floor, yep, yeah, there's BU-205. If, for example, and I would not urge this, but if, for example, we made email the primary key to the faculty table, which we could do, right, because I'm not saying it's a good idea, but we could do it, right, because every faculty person is assigned an email address here, so we could do that. That would be an example of a natural key, right, because I want to email my instructor. What's their instructor's email? mzellers at lorraineccc.edu. Anyone in the world can send me an email, and I'll get it, right? It makes sense outside of the database. That's a real attribute of me, my email address, all right? If we were to do telephone number or anything like that, none of, not that these are particularly good examples of things for primary key, those all make sense. Those are all real uh, attributes that you can associate with a member of that entity. But the surrogate key isn't, and that's what makes it a surrogate key. Now, we'll be talking about implementing this in a minute in access surrogate key is called an auto number field or an auto number key. All right, we'll take a look at implementing this at, at, in access in a minute. Um, the question then becomes, what do I do with the rest of the fields that are candidate keys that I didn't pick? All right. So, for example, getting back to my employee number issue, I have my employee table, and there are two fields that could have been primary key. The employee ID, name, that can't be primary key. City, that can't be primary key. State, that can't be primary key. Zip, that can't be. Social security number, ooh, that could be primary key. So it's a candidate key. I apply these reasons down here and say, yeah, employee number is a better choice. So I elect that candidate to the office of primary key. What do I do with the rest of them then? All right? I can't just leave them as regular fields. All right? Why can't I leave them as regular fields? What would the, what would the potential issue if I left social security number just as a regular, regular old field, nine digit number? Could get duplicates. Yeah, you could get duplicates by mistake. 
You could transpose digits and, and have two people with the same social security number. And that wouldn't be good. All right? So, although we have decided not to use the social security number to be the primary key in the table, we still want the constraints associated with the primary key to apply to that field. What are the constraints associated with the primary key? Every row has to have one, has to be unique. So how do we do that? Well, in Access, when you define a field, you can say if that field's required or not. So that part's simple. All right, and we'll, we'll look at an example of, of doing this in a minute here. However, how do we guarantee that it's unique? This is where we create an index on it. And specifically, we create a unique index on that field. So, what is an index? An index allows us to look up quickly by a particular field. The best analogy I can, I can think of is, you know, if you were, for example, to go over to Student Life Now, and, and, and say you wanted to talk uh, to someone about your bill, you know. Or, you know, better yet, you know, I call, I call uh, you know, uh, some company and I want to talk to them about my bill. What's the first thing they're going to ask me? What's, your, What's account? your account number? Why is that, why are they asking me that? Because it's the primary key. It's the easiest way to look things up. All right. Now, of course I don't know the account number, right? That's why I'm calling them, because I lost the bill and I don't know how much I owe or whatever. So what's the next thing they're going to ask me? They're going to ask me something else, right? They're going to ask me my telephone number. They're going to ask me my social security number. They're going to ask me my name and city I live in. They're going to ask me some other fields. And then they'll go and they'll look me up by that. Now, they're only going to ask me some predefined fields, right? They're not going to, like, say, you know, they're probably not going to say, like, what's your birthday? And they might, but they probably won't in this case. There's going to be some predefined fields that they're going to ask me. And probably, if I don't know one, they'll, they'll ask me the next one. Like, I don't know, what would be an example? Let's say I'm calling Verizon. What's your account number? Don't know. What's your cell phone number? I can't remember my cell phone number because I never call myself. All right, so I don't know that either. Okay, then, what's your social security number? Okay, that I remember. Boom, there we go. All right. What they likely have in their database are indexes created on those fields. And indexes are like, again, indexes in a card catalog in the library in the old days. It's a way to look up things quickly. All right. So back in the old days, when you would walk into a library, there'd actually be cabinets of index cards. And there'd be one for the title of the book, there'd be one for the author, there'd be one for the subject. All right. So if you knew you wanted a book titled something specific, you might go to the title one, right? Because that's sort of your first choice. If you don't know the name of the book, but you know you want a book about Ansel Adams, for example. You'd go and look under the subject of Ansel Adams. If you couldn't quite remember that guy's name, but, oh, he is that famous photographer. So I'm going to look up by subject then when you look up photography. All right? So there's multiple ways, and the indexes are organized to allow you just to jump to the thing that you're looking for and find it directly. Because if there weren't any indexes, what would you have to do? Imagine if the library was just a big old pile of books. What would you have to do if you wanted a book? You'd have to look at the first book on the shelf. Nope, that's not it. Second book, third book. Exhaustively until you got, until you either gave up or you found the book that you're looking for or you hit the end of the stacks and says, oh, that's right, this library doesn't have it. It's, it's a public library that has this book. All right. The index allows you to jump right in. And even now, if you go to a library page online, they have implemented indexes. You can look things up by a couple of things, but not everything. All right? Now, 
When you create the indexes, you pick the things that you think are, are reasonable for people to want to look data up by. You don't say something like, gee, I'm going to make this very flexible and I'm going to let people look it up by any number of things. You know, number of pages. I want a 300 page book. I don't remember the name of the book and I don't remember what it's about, but I remember it was about 300 pages. So let me look up all the 300 page books. All right? You're not going to create an index for that. Even now in the computer day, uh, days where you, you don't have that. Why wouldn't they do it back in the old days? Well, because you'd have to have a big old cabinet with all these cards organized by the number of pages. And that would take a lot of time to, to update, right? Every time a new book came in, you'd have to put it in each of the cabinets, each of the indexes for title, author, subject, and number of pages. So that would add work to the librarian every time a new book came in. Also, it would take up space, right? You know, finally, if you color of the cover, I don't remember what the name of the book was, but I remember I had a blue cover. So let's look up by that, all right? It'd be a waste of space physically to have all these different card cabinets in the library back in the old days. Well, guess what? Even now, it's a waste of space, of disk space, to have indexes that aren't likely to be used. So typically, you create indexes on those fields that are likely to be used. So getting to our employee example, by virtue of being the primary key, this is indexed already. You don't have to create a special index for that. I might want to create an index by employee name. All right, to look up someone by name. That's reasonable that I want to look up by name. You go to human resources, what's your employee number? Oh, I don't remember. Well, what's your name? Uh, okay. And you might want to do it for social security number, but for social security number, we're doing it for another reason as well, and that is we can specify that it's not just an index, but it's a unique index. And that means that you can't have duplicates. So, Let's go in and let's create um, a couple of simple tables, and we'll see how far we get today. All right. Go ahead. Um, I, I guess I'm a little confused about the um, creating the index for the candidate keys. Mm -hmm. That's what causes it to say it has to be unique? Yes. When you is, create, that, is that an access thing, or is that that's just a general database? That's a general database thing. In other words, all or nearly all databases I can think of support indexes. And they support indexes uh, that can either be unique or not unique. When you specify a unique index, that means that there can only be one member of the table that has a particular value. An example of a not unique index would be name. Right? There could be two people that have that same name. So I want to index it. I want to be able to look up by name. But it's okay if two people have the same name because two people could have the same name. All right? Um, as opposed to um, Social Security number where there shouldn't be two people that have the same Social Security number. Therefore, I'm going to make sure that there are two people that don't have the Social Security number. So when you define the index, you specify whether it's a unique index or not. I'm going to make, um, I teach this a different way each time, and, and this time I'm going to do, we're going to go and create a couple of tables, and then we're going to do some ASP.NET stuff, just so that we're not doing consistently database theory, all right? We'll do some ASP.NET stuff, then we'll come back to more database-related stuff, but I'm going to create these two tables, an employee table that's going to have as a primary key employee ID. A name, city, state, zip, social security number that I'll make a unique index for. And it'll have a foreign key to the department ID. All right. The department ID um, is going to be in a, uh, the department's going to be in a table by itself whose primary key is department ID and whose has the attribute of department name. Now, you might ask yourself, why do I have a department ID? Couldn't the department name be the primary key? All right. There's no two accounting departments in a company, right? It's not like, you know, I belong to the accounting department. Well, which one? Well, there's only one accounting department. So couldn't I use a department name 
for primary key? Yeah, you could. All right, because within an organization, they probably, in fact, it's probably a safe bet to say that the department name is unique. Why do I use a department ID then? Well, I use a department ID because even though that is unique, I think I can do better if I make up my own key, if I make up a surrogate key. All right? Because that surrogate key, surrogate key is always a candidate key, right? You can say, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to add a surrogate key to this. And then I get the advantage of this is going to be a smaller field than that. All right? So I guess what I'm saying is in many cases you will make things a surrogate key, even if there is a logical choice for a primary key. In fact, in most tables that I create, I use surrogate keys exclusively. All right, most databases I create, I use surrogate keys for the most part exclusively. Why? Because they fit all the characteristics of a good key. They're single column, all right, they're numbers, and they're short. They start with one. Can't get any shorter than that. All right, so because of that, an auto number or surrogate key is, in my opinion, always a good bet. All right. Now, there are people that would say that prefer natural keys to surrogate keys. I'm not one of those people. Surrogate keys work fine for me. We'll talk a little bit more about that now, but let's go in and let's do some two tables, do some stuff, and then we'll do some .NET stuff, either today or, or next. So let's go in, <coughs> go into Access, create this guy. It's like when you just totally go blank and you have no idea what program you're looking for. All right, I'm going to create a blank database. I am going to create it on the desktop. And I will call it employees. Or actually, I'll call it because um, employee is going to be a table. I'm going to call it my human resources database. All right, so. Reason we're not seeing the whole screen. Doing the resolution thing. Ah, okay. Let's try this. Let's trick it. Change the screen resolution. seeing the whole screen now? Mm -hmm. All right, let's now try setting it back. And you're seeing it now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let's go in here and I'm going to make my database. I'm going to put it on the desktop and I'm going to call it HR because my human resources database. It knows, hey, you wouldn't have gone through all this trouble to open up access if you weren't creating a database with tables in it. So it gives you a table for free. All right. Now, keep in mind that access is not really uh, like an industrial strength tool. All right. Access is meant for folks that um, want to do some database stuff, but maybe don't know a lot about databases. So a lot of the features in Access are geared towards that sort of user. So you're, you're able to just like start entering stuff in, entering fields in like a spreadsheet. 
because people love spreadsheets and they know spreadsheets. So they make the initial entry and access look like a spreadsheet. Now, we're using access just because it's simple and you're probably already somewhat familiar with it. Um, but we're going to go into design view to do all our real work. We're not going to use the, the tools meant for, for novices. So we'll go into design view. I have to name my table. I'll call it employee. It's nudging you in the direction to create an auto number key. Which, if you're a novice, that's probably a pretty good bet. Pretty safe bet. Right? Can't really go wrong with that. The only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name from ID to employee ID. By convention, I like to give the name of the key, whatever the table name is, ID. So this is the employee table, so the primary key I'm going to make employee ID. And then I will call it employee ID and all the related tables as well. Now that doesn't mean anything to the database necessarily. It just keeps it easier for me to, to keep track of. So I know if I'm connecting things together and making a foreign key that um, the employee ID in one table is called the employee ID in another table. So I'll put in name. And really, I should do a first name and last name, but I'm lazy, so I'll just do the one. Um, I'll put in an email address. Put in all the fields associated with an employee, but one of the fields I'm going to put is department ID. And that's going to be a number. Now, it's not an auto number, because we don't, every time we add an employee, we don't generate a new department, right? When we add an employee, though, we want to connect that employee with the department to which they belong. So, therefore, we need to know the department ID that they belong to. So, I'm going to create the department ID as a number. All right. So, we're done with this table. I'm going to go in and create another table. Go into design view and call it department. And I'll call this department ID. And I'll call this department name. It'll be text. Oops. And I'll save that. Now, I missed a couple of things, right? I, I wanted to be sure to add the social security number in here. Now, with each field, you have a choice of constraints that you can apply on it. In this case, we want it to be required, right? Because everyone has to have a social security number. So I'll go and I'll click on required. Also, there's an option to create it, to make it indexed. And here's where we say duplicates OK or no duplicates allowed. In this case, because Social Security number is meant to be a, or is a candidate key, we don't want to allow duplicates. All right. Almost there. Last thing we have to do is we have to create the relationship between employee and department. Now, it, is, it isn't enough that I call the field department ID in both tables. I have to tell it that there's a connection between the two. So you do that under database tools and relationships. You pick the two tables. And you simply drag the one on to the other. And you click Enforce Referential Integrity. Enforce Referential Integrity is what actually makes it a foreign key. 
There are only the very rarest of instances, and those usually relate to converting data from one format to another, that you would want to temporarily not enforce referential integrity. If you're developing something from scratch, you certainly want to enforce it because that's like the major benefit of a database, to make sure that these constraints